chapter seven of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven in the peasant's hut for a moment the two young men stood silent and astounded so sudden had been the change from imminent peril to safety that they could hardly comprehend it luigi vampa had come and gone like a flash and both bandits and danger had been dispelled by the wonderful magic of monte cristo's name the brigand chief had styled giovanni and esprance his friends and as such they knew the entire country in the vicinity of rome was free to them they could travel it by day or by night without fear of molestation esprance cared little for this but giovanni was elated by it for it would enable him to seek out annunziata solara without risk of interruption or impediment but what was the count of monte cristo's mysterious power that was a question difficult indeed to answer at any rate even the fierce luigi vampa bowed to it and it was as undisputed as it was strange the viscount massetti was the first to realize the necessity of a rapid push for rome he was faint from loss of blood and excitement besides his shattered arm throbbed violently and gave him twinges of excruciating pain he felt himself sinking and urged his friend to hasten esprance acquiesced and supporting the young italian as best he could they resumed the homeward journey scarcely a mile had been traversed however when giovanni threw himself upon the sward at the foot of a great tree declaring that it was altogether impossible for him to advance another step the throbbing in his arm had become unbearable taking his breath away and filling him with a sickening sensation they were yet far from rome and not a sign of a habitation could be discerned in any direction waiting for daylight to come was not to be thought of it would be some hours before dawn and even when the sun had arisen it was by no means certain that assistance would be procurable meanwhile giovanni would suffer torments to say nothing of the danger of being exposed in his condition to the influence of the malaria from the surrounding marshes esprance though unwilling to leave his friend's side for an instant decided at last that it was imperative for him to go in search of succour meanwhile a raging fever had set in and giovanni was rapidly growing worse as the son of monte cristo was about to start on his tour of investigation he heard a man's voice singing at some distance away but gradually coming nearer the sound was cheery and reassuring for certainly the man who could sing so sweetly and joyously must have a good kind heart as the man approached despaiance recognized his song it was that beautiful and expressive serenade caronina a melody dear to all youthful italian lovers whether humble or of high degree the man at length came in sight he was walking leisurely but with a long swinging gait his voice was a clear full tenor robusto and the notes of his delicious love-song trilled from his throat with wonderful effect in the still balmy air of the tranquil glorious night he was not over twenty was a stalwart peasant and the moonlight showed that he possessed a manly open countenance so engrossed was he by his serenade that he failed to notice giovanni lying at the foot of the huge tree and esprance standing beside him he was passing on when the latter hailed him he paused somewhat alarmed and his hand instinctively grasped a weapon concealed in his bosom esprance hastened to reassure him have no fear he said we are merely travellers and one of us is grievously wounded in heaven's name render what assistance you can the young peasant turned and came cautiously towards them this is a dangerous neighbourhood said he it is infested by bandits of the most reckless and daring description we have abundant reason to know it answered esprance for we have just had a very narrow escape from a horrible death at the hands of some of luigi vampa's men luigi vampa's men echoed the peasant in astonishment yes and they released you of their own accord i never heard of such a thing it is not their custom to free their prey at least without a heavy ransom did they rob you or did you pay them for your liberty neither 
replied espérance the peasant's amazement was redoubled he glanced inquiringly at the prostrate viscount how came your comrade to be wounded he asked his arm was shattered by the pistol of a gigantic bandit ludovico demanded the peasant glancing around him as if he expected to see the huge assailant i believe that was his name returned espérance but he will do no more injury you do not mean to say that you killed him i do and yet you were allowed to go free i cannot understand it perhaps not but you can understand that my friend is badly hurt and needs immediate aid and shelter is there not some hospitable cabin in the vicinity to which he can be conveyed where he can be attended to until assistance arrives from rome the peasant hesitated for an instant then he said my father lives at a short distance from here he could shelter you if he would but he is in such terror of the bandits that under the circumstances he would probably close his door against you he need have no fear of the brigands in this case for luigi vampa has just given us a signal proof of his protection besides he assured us that he was our friend this is singular indeed said the peasant again hesitating luigi vampa is a friend to but very few and they are those with whom he is in league you certainly are not in league with him or you would not have killed ludovico this is no time for parley replied espérance my friend is suffering and humanity alone should cause your father to receive him i will engage to appease luigi vampa's anger should it be aroused at the worst i pledge myself to surrender with my friend at the first summons to do so and to assure the brigand chief that your father is altogether blameless come can i not prevail upon you to be generous and humane well said the peasant partially satisfied i will trust you though i am taking a great risk should vampa be offended he will burn our hut over our heads and murder us all without pity however both your wounded friend and yourself shall have such poor shelter as our humble roof affords giovanni was aided to arise and taking him between them espérance and the peasant began their walk fortunately they did not have far to go otherwise the young viscount's failing strength would have been unequal to the task they quitted the highway plunging into a narrow footpath closely wooded on either side so thickly in fact did the tree branches interlace overhead that the moonbeams were effectually excluded and almost impenetrable darkness reigned for an instant espérance was apprehensive of treachery but this fear was dispelled when he thought of the manly bearing of the youthful peasant and the dread of the brigands he had expressed the three could scarcely walk abreast in the narrow pathway and every now and then giovanni stumbled against some protruding root or other obstacle invisible in the obscurity but the peasant knew the road perfectly and with no uncertain step hurried his companions on as rapidly as possible soon the path widened somewhat the light commenced to sift through the dense foliage and the gurgling of a noisy brook was heard at no great distance suddenly they made an abrupt turn coming in sight of a small neat-looking cabin covered with clustering vines and embowered in verdure the brook dashed along within a few yards of it the fresh odour of the water mingling gratefully with the perfume of honeysuckles and the aromatic scent of the surrounding forest it was indeed a beautiful and highly romantic spot a cosy sequestered nook such as that in which king henry hid away his love the fair rosamond from the prying glances of the inquisitive world espérance gazed at it with rapture and even giovanni wounded and exhausted as he was could not refrain from uttering an exclamation of astonishment and admiration the cabin was closed and not a sign of life was visible we have arrived said the peasant in a low voice quitting his companions he went to a window against which he gave three distinct raps the signal was almost immediately answered by three similar raps from within then the window was thrown open and a woman's head appeared the moonlight fell full upon her face and both espérance and giovanni suddenly started as they recognized annunziata solara the bewitching flower-girl of the piazza del popolo it is she it is annunziata 
whispered the young viscount in his comrade's ear hush returned the latter in a guarded undertone do not betray yourself she will never recognize us disguised as we are besides our guide's suspicions must not be aroused he might yet refuse us shelter you are right as you always are answered massetti we must maintain our incognito at least until we are sure of our ground meanwhile the peasant was speaking hastily with annunziata sister he said i am not alone two travellers peasants like ourselves are with me they were attacked by luigi vampa's men and one of them is sorely wounded holy virgin exclaimed the girl evidently filled with terror they claim our hospitality for the night and our assistance until aid can be procured from rome in my father's name i have accorded them shelter open the door and admit us the girl disappeared from the window and in another instant had flung the door open as she stood there in the silvery light the state of her garments and hair indicating that she had hurriedly risen from her couch her bright picturesque beauty was vastly heightened the young men thought they had never beheld a more entrancing vision of female loveliness where is father asked the peasant anxiously he has not yet returned replied the girl the guide uttered a sigh of relief i am glad said he for pasquale solara does not like strangers were he here he might refuse to exercise hospitality towards this wounded man and his companion even though they are as they assert friends of luigi vampa friends of luigi vampa echoed the girl becoming greatly alarmed the blessed virgin protect us they are not brigands at any rate said the peasant and i believe them honest men if however they are deceiving me i shall know how to act there was an ominous flash in his eye as he spoke and his hand again sought the weapon concealed within his bosom espérance who had been intently listening to this conversation and had marked every motion of the young peasant felt his suspicions revive but there was no time for hesitation shelter and aid for his friend were of the first necessity they must be obtained at once and at any cost he had refrained from offering the peasant money not wishing to betray that he and his companion were other personages than they seemed and now that annunziata had appeared upon the scene he congratulated himself on the wisdom of his course he nevertheless feared giovanni's impulsiveness in the presence of the girl he so much admired and determined to watch him as closely as possible in order to promptly check all damaging disclosures if giovanni remained in this attractive nook long enough to open and carry on a flirtation with the beautiful flower-girl he must do so solely as a peasant and under the cover of his clever disguise it was hardly likely that annunziata would recognize in massetti and himself the two youthful gallants she had encountered but for a moment amid the gay throng and crush of the brilliant piazza del popolo while these thoughts went flashing through his mind the young viscount leaning heavily upon his arm had not taken his eyes from the handsome tempting girl before him suffering as he was he longed to be at her side to clasp her lovely shape to feel her warm voluptuous breath stream over his face and imprint kiss after kiss on her ripe red lips he had not forgotten zuleika oh no but annunziata solara was an altogether different being a girl to delight him intoxicate him for a moment as the other for life for monte cristo's daughter his feeling was love for the fascinating flower-girl of the piazza del popolo it was a passion to be sated after a few more words to his sister the peasant returned to the young men aiding esperance to transport giovanni into the cabin the interior of this humble abode was as neat and picturesque as the exterior the room they entered was small and cheaply furnished but feminine taste was everywhere displayed a single candle was the only light but the scanty illumination sufficed to show the refining touches of a woman's hand in one corner stood a bed the covers of which were turned down and upon which was impressed the shape of its late occupant at the head of the bed a brass crucifix was suspended from the wall while over the back of a chair hung articles of a woman's apparel 
giovanni could not doubt that he was in annunziata's chamber and that the imprint on the bed was hers he felt a thrill of joy at the idea that he was to occupy the bewitching flower-girl's couch to occupy perhaps the very place where she had lain but a short time before annunziata who had thrown a cloak over her shoulders and night-clothes but whose feet were still bare had accompanied her brother and his companions to the apartment she eyed the strangers timidly but curiously though it was quite plain she failed to penetrate their disguise with deft hands she rearranged the bed and removed her garments from the chair then she retired to another room and the wounded viscount was aided to undress and assisted into the couch by the peasant and esperance where he eventually fell asleep in a delirium of bliss after his hurt had been properly cared for esperance was duly bestowed for the night and soon unbroken silence brooded over the solitary cabin in the forest thus was enacted the initial scene of a drama that was destined to be fruitful in disastrous results results that clouded more than one happy life End of chapter seven chapter eight of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight a sylvan idol in the morning the viscount massetti's arm was found to be so much swollen and his wound so painful that it was deemed advisable to send for a physician who resided in a neighboring hamlet not more than a mile distant from the cabin of the solaras the man of medicine was soon at giovanni's bedside after examining and dressing his hurt he declared that the patient ought not to be moved for at least a week a piece of intelligence at which the young man inwardly rejoiced notwithstanding all the torture he suffered for his sojourn involved nursing at the hands of the beautiful annunziata who had already shown him that she possessed tenderness and a kind heart as well as good looks esperance held a conference with his friend after the physician's departure to decide upon what should be done he proposed to go at once to rome and acquaint the viscount's family with what had happened and giovanni's condition but the young man firmly opposed this plan declaring that he would be well in a few days at most and protesting that informing his relatives of his situation would involve explanations he had no desire to give giovanni also begged esperance to remain with him and give no sign as to their place of retreat so earnestly did he solicit these favours that the son of monte cristo much against his will and with many forebodings finally consented to grant them pasquale solara returned home late on the day following the arrival of the strangers at his hut he was an old but sturdy shepherd whose rough sunburned visage spoke of exposure to the weather and hard toil he frequently was absent for days and nights in succession absences that he never explained and about which his son and daughter did not dare to question him for pasquale was a harsh man who grew angry at the slightest pretext and was inclined to be severe with all who sought to pry into his affairs he expressed great fear of the bandits who infested the vicinity of rome and especially of luigi vampa's band but those who knew him best shook their heads doubtingly and though they did not say so it was plainly to be seen that they deemed this fear merely assumed for purposes of his own at any rate it was a significant fact that pasquale was never disturbed in his wanderings while the brigands always left his dwelling and its inmates unmolested the old shepherd frowned darkly when informed by his children that they had given shelter to a couple of travellers one of whom had been wounded in a fight with a brigand but he said nothing and appeared disposed to accept the situation without even a grumble 
he did not however enter the chamber in which giovanni lay and avoided coming in contact with espérance who caught but a passing glimpse of him ere he departed again on another expedition which he did after a stay of only half an hour at his cabin the young peasant and espérance soon became quite friendly indulging in many a ramble in the forest and beside the gurgling brook the peasant's name was lorenzo and he appeared to lead a free life totally unencumbered with avocation of any kind save occasionally looking after a few sheep that never strayed far from the banks of the little stream annunziata for the time abandoned her visits to rome installing herself as giovanni's nurse she was almost constantly beside him and her presence and care were more potent medicines than any the physician administered her smile seemed to exercise a bewitching effect upon the young viscount while her voice sounded in his ravished ear like the sweetest music the handsome girl was the very picture of perfect health and her well-developed form had all the charm of early maturity added to youthful freshness and grace she wore short skirts and her shapely limbs were never encumbered with stockings while her feet were invariably bare a low loose body with short sleeves displayed her robust neck and shoulders and plump dimpled arms that would have been the envy of a duchess her hands as well as her feet were not small and the sun had given them a liberal coat of brown but they were neatly turned and attractive while her short taper fingers were tipped with pink carefully trimmed nails altogether she looked like the spirit of the place a delicious wood-nymph as enchanting as any a poet's fancy ever created and yet a substantial mortal reality well calculated to fire a man's blood and set his brain in a whirl if she had appeared beautiful in rome amid the aristocratic fashion queens of the piazza del popolo she seemed a thousandfold more delightful and fascinating in her humble forest home where she shook off all restraint and showed herself as she really was a bright innocent child of nature as pure as the breath of heaven and as free from guile as the honey-fed butterfly of the summer sunshine the more giovanni saw of her the more he came under the dominion of her irresistible charms the empire of her physical attractiveness gradually he mended and as his wound healed his strength returned at length towards the close of the week he was able to quit his bed and sit in a large chair by the window of his room it had been agreed upon between him and espérance that during their sojourn at the solara cabin they should be known respectively as antonio valpi and giuseppe segasta and already annunziata had bestowed upon her patient the friendly and familiar diminutive of tonio a name to which he answered with wildly beating heart and eyes that spoke volumes by means of shrewdly managed questions the young viscount had ascertained that the flower-girl had no lover that her breast had never owned the tender passion and this intelligence added fuel to the flame that was consuming him it is not to be supposed that annunziata was ignorant of the strong impression she had made upon her youthful and handsome patient she was perfectly aware of it and secretly rejoiced at the manifest exhibition of the power of her charms perhaps she did not as yet love giovanni perhaps it was merely the general physical attraction of a woman towards a man or it might have been that innate spice of coquetry common to every female but the fact remained that she tacitly encouraged the young viscount in his ardent attentions to her she moreover lured and inflamed him in such a careless innocent way that she acquired additional piquancy thereby had annunziata been a designing woman of the world intent upon trapping a wealthy lover instead of a pure and artless country maid totally unconscious of the harm she was working she could not have played her game with more effect 
giovanni had become altogether her slave he hung upon her smiles drank her words and could hardly restrain himself in her presence no shipwrecked mariner ever more greedily devoured with his dazzled eyes the fateful lorelei of a rocky deserted coast than he did her had she been his social equal had her intelligence and education matched her personal beauty he would have forgotten zuleika thrown himself impetuously at her feet and solicited her hand as it was while monte cristo's daughter possessed his entire heart annunziata solara enslaved his senses she received his approaches as a matter of course without diffidence without a blush his gallant speeches pleased her she did not know why so thoroughly unsuspicious was she that she failed to notice his language was not that of the untutored peasant he claimed to be that his bearing as well as his words indicated a degree of culture and refinement far above his assumed station she was dazzled charmed by him as the bird is by the glittering serpent with its wicked fascinating eyes she thought of nothing but the present and its novel joys she had never heeded the future she did not heed it now one morning as she sat at his side by the open window through which stole the balmy air of the forest laden with the intoxicating perfume of a thousand wild intensely sweet flowers giovanni suddenly took her brown hand covering it with passionate kisses the girl did not resist did not withdraw her hand from his she did not even tremble though a slight glow came into her cheeks making her look like a very circe annunziata said giovanni in a low voice scarcely above a whisper do you care for me care for you tonio replied the girl gazing sweetly into his glowing and agitated countenance oh yes i care a great deal for you he threw his arm about her neck and as his hand lay upon her shapely shoulder a magnetic thrill shot through him like a sudden shock from a powerful electric battery annunziata did not seek to withdraw herself from his warm embrace and he drew her to him with tightening clasp until her full palpitating bosom rested against his breast her tempting red lips slightly parted were upturned he placed his upon them in a long lingering delirious kiss then the colour deepened in her cheeks and she gently disengaged herself she did not however avert her eyes but gazed into his with a look of mute inquiry all this was new to her and the more delicious because of its entire novelty neither my father nor my brother nor my dead mother ever kissed me like that she said artlessly giovanni was enraptured the girl's innocence was absolutely marvellous he had never dreamed that such innocence existed upon earth was she really what she appeared annunziata he said abruptly his heart beating furiously and his breath coming thick and fast you have never experienced love or you would know the meaning of that kiss love answered the girl opening her large lustrous eyes widely oh yes i have felt love i love my father and lorenzo i love everybody but not as you would love a young man who would throw himself at your pretty feet and pour out the treasures of his heart to you no young man has ever done that said annunziata smiling and nestling closer to him but some one will before long perhaps before many minutes how would you like me to be that one cried the viscount in his headlong fashion i cannot tell answered the girl i do not know then let me try the experiment said giovanni rising from his chair and sinking on his knees in front of her annunziata i love you the girl stroked his hair and then passed her taper fingers through his flowing locks she was silent and seemed to be thinking her bosom heaved just a little more than usual and the glow on her cheeks became a trifle more intense giovanni yet kneeling seized her hand holding it in a crushing clasp do you hear me he cried impatiently do you understand me i love you 
you love me tonio replied the girl slowly well it is only natural every young man must love some young girl some time or other and i think i think i love you a little think said giovanni amazed do you not know it perhaps answered annunziata still fondling his hair giovanni threw his arms about her waist an ample healthful waist free from the restraints of corsets and the cramping devices of fashion as he did so the sound of footsteps was heard without and he had scarcely time to leap to his feet when esperance entered the room massetti was confused and his friend noticed the fact he also remarked that annunziata was slightly flushed and seemed to have experienced some agreeable agitation esperance instantly leaped to a conclusion giovanni's flirtation with the fair flower-girl had gone a trifle too far had assumed a serious aspect he would interfere he would remonstrate with him it might not yet be too late after all annunziata was a pure and innocent creature unused to the ways of the world and incapable of suspecting the wickedness of men she was on the point of falling into a deadly snare on the point of being wrecked upon the most dangerous shoal life presented her very purity and innocence would make her an easy victim giovanni was not wicked he was merely young the prey of the irresistible passion of youth annunziata's surpassing loveliness had fired his blood had driven him to the verge of a reckless action a crime against this beautiful girl that money could not repair this crime should not be committed if he could help it and he would risk the viscount's friendship to save him from himself giovanni could not marry the humble peasant girl he should not mar her future when esperance came into the chamber his presence recalled annunziata to herself and also dampened massetti's ardour the girl arose and smiling at esperance tripped blushingly away giovanni was flushed and somewhat angry at the intrusion at the critical moment of his love-making esperance's face was grave he felt all the weight of the responsibility he was about to assume giovanni said he in a measured tone i do not blame you for being fascinated by a pretty amiable girl like annunziata solara far from it she is certainly a paragon of beauty a model of rustic grace a very tempting morsel of rural virtue and innocence she is well fitted to turn the head of almost any young man i freely acknowledge that it is pardonable to wish to enjoy her society nay a harmless flirtation with her is perhaps not censurable but that is the utmost length to which a man of honour can go remember she has a reputation to lose a heart to break what do you mean by that long sermon demanded the viscount setting his teeth and frowning savagely i mean that you have been making love to this poor girl that you have been seeking to requite her care of you in a manner but little to your credit i owe oh, you my life esperance replied massetti but even my gratitude will not shield you from my fury if you step between me and annunziata solara you mean to pursue her then to soil her name to blast her future for surely you are not courting her with marriage as your object giovanni flushed scarlet at this open accusation i mean to pursue her yes what my object in the matter is concerns only myself you have nothing whatever to do with it he exclaimed hotly but i have a great deal to do with it replied esperance firmly you shall not pursue annunziata solara to her destruction between her good name and your reckless intentions i will oppose a barrier you cannot surmount myself do you mean to champion her to the extent of challenging me demanded massetti fairly foaming with ire if you persist in your nefarious designs yes answered the son of monte cristo with equal warmth you are my friend my friend of friends giovanni massetti but the instant you menace that innocent girl's honour 
my friendship for you crumbles to dust and you become my deadly foe take your choice either leave this hospitable cabin with me as soon as the state of your wound will permit you to do so meanwhile respecting annunziata solara as you would your own sister or meet me pistol in hand on the field of honour take your choice i say what is your decision i will not give up annunziata then you must fight i shall not hesitate so be it my life against yours i will defend this poor girl's honour to the last drop of my blood when shall we fight to-morrow at dawn where in the clearing beyond the chestnut copse on the further side of the brook there is no need of witnesses this matter is between us and us alone so much the better for it will be a duel to the death i cannot as yet hold my right arm aloft long enough to fight with it but i will make my left hand serve then as a sudden thought struck him massetti added do you propose to betray me to carry your story to annunziata and her brother esperance surveyed his companion with intense scorn flashing from his eyes i am no traitor he said coldly and turning quitted the apartment End of chapter 8chapter nine of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the abduction the remainder of that day esperance and giovanni did not meet again they purposely avoided each other the former because he did not wish to have a further quarrel with the viscount and the latter because he dreaded a repetition of the accusations of dishonourable conduct which had stung him deeper than he would own even to himself espérance disdained to play the spy upon massetti but nevertheless he determined not to quit the immediate vicinity of the cabin and to be as watchful as circumstances would permit nothing however occurred to arouse his suspicions as long as daylight lasted once or twice giovanni quitted his chamber and walked back and forth excitedly on the sward in front of the hut but his promenades were of very short duration seeming to have no other object than to calm his seething brain annunziata did not go near him though whether coquetry or fear caused her to pursue this course esperance was unable to determine but her action gratified him because it gave giovanni no opportunity to follow up whatever advantage he might have gained with the flower-girl lorenzo appeared to have no suspicion whatever that anything was amiss either with the young men or his sister he was as light-hearted and cheerful as ever going about his usual trifling occupations with gaiety that was absolutely contagious and displaying even more than his accustomed amiability espérance had grown to esteem this youthful peasant highly he had found his manliness and generosity personified and had resolved on his return to rome to interest the count of monte cristo in his welfare and advancement with regard to annunziata espérance was as yet altogether undecided she was a problem he could not solve her innocence and virtue were apparent but her childlike simplicity and utter lack of worldly experience while so charming and delightful to behold added to her wonderful beauty exposed her to risks that were frightful to contemplate had she only possessed a lover in her own rank of life all would have been well with her but she possessed no lover was absolutely alone if she escaped giovanni and esperance was determined she sh should escape him if he could effect it the chances were that she would eventually fall into the clutches of some other admirer still more reckless and unscrupulous the son of monte cristo could not think of the lovely girl and her future without a pang that made his very heart ache he too admired her beauty her grace and her artlessness but his admiration was confined within the proper bounds and could he have seen her suitably and happily wedded he would have rejoiced to the depths of his soul 
late in the afternoon pasquale solara reappeared suddenly and without the least warning the old man was covered with dust as if he had been journeying far on foot he plainly showed that he was greatly fatigued also that something had occurred to irritate him he entered the cabin unobserved and was there for some moments before his presence was discovered annunziata was the first to see him sitting upon a rude wooden bench with his stout oaken staff in his hand on which he leaned heavily she threw her arms about his neck with a cry of joy endeavouring to snatch a kiss from his tightly closed lips but he sternly and silently repulsed her lorenzo in his turn met with no warmer reception at his father's hands but his children were used to pasquale's moods and were therefore altogether unaffected by his present morose deportment they speedily left him to himself giving themselves no further trouble concerning him once when esperance came into the room the old man stared at him inquiringly as if he had utterly forgotten the fact that strangers were enjoying the shelter of his roof then he appeared to recollect and scowled so savagely that the young man beat a hasty retreat going to seek lorenzo whose cheery voice was heard singing beyond the brook as esperance came in sight of the little stream he nearly stumbled over a peasant lying at full length beneath the spreading branches of an aged willow the stranger was reading a book and esperance was amazed to notice that it was caesar's commentaries he uttered an apology for his awkwardness but the peasant only smiled and in a gentle voice begged pardon for being in the way that voice esperance was certain he had heard it before but where or when he could not recall though it thrilled him to the very marrow of his bones filling him with vague apprehensions the man's face too was familiar as also was his attire but there was great similarity between the italian peasants in the vicinity of rome in general looks and dress it was quite likely that he had not seen this man before but some other resembling him still the voice and face troubled esperance and he decided to question the peasant the rarity of strangers visits to this sequestered locality would be a sufficient pretext for his curiosity my friend said he addressing the recumbent reader who had resumed his book are you a relative or acquaintance of the solaras i am neither replied the man carelessly glancing up from his volume and allowing his penetrating eyes to rest on his questioner i strolled here by chance and this cosy nook was so inviting that i took possession of it without a thought as to the intrusion i was committing the peasant's language was refined esperance noted this fact and was not a little surprised thereby in addition he could not understand why the stranger should be reading caesar's commentaries a work far beyond the range of the usual peasant intellect you are committing no intrusion said he lorenzo and annunziata i am sure would be glad to welcome you old pasquale is somewhat of a savage it is true but luckily he does not bother himself much about anything or anybody pasquale has arrived then said the man dropping his book and evincing a sudden interest yes he is in the cabin now answered esperance his astonishment increasing do you want to speak with him no said the peasant lightly springing to his feet he hastily closed his book thrust it into his belt and bowing to esperance disappeared in the forest the young man looked after him for an instant then he joined lorenzo and informed him of the meeting at his first words annunziata's brother ceased singing a cloud overspread his brow and he asked in an eager tone for a description of the curiously behaved stranger esperance gave it to him remarking as he did so that his companion turned slightly pale and seemed frightened who is this man he asked as he concluded do you know him he appeared strangely familiar to me do i know him repeated lorenzo with a shudder yes that is no esperance stared at his comrade in surprise and uneasiness the youthful peasant evidently had more knowledge of the singular intruder than he was willing to admit there was surely some mystery here what was it did the presence of this stranger menace 
the peace the tranquillity the safety of the solara family was he in some dark way associated with the movements and actions of old pasquale esperance attempted to question lorenzo further but he only shook his head and declined to make any disclosures he however stipulated that his sister should not be informed of what had occurred urging that there was no necessity of uselessly alarming her alarming her what could he mean esperance grew more and more perplexed and his conviction that he had met the stranger previously increasing in strength added to his anxiety and discomfort for some hours giovanni had kept his room and given no sign what was he meditating was it possible that he was concocting some cunning plan by which to circumvent intervention and gain undisturbed possession of the girl who had so powerfully influenced his passions could it be that he was in some mysterious way associated with the strange peasant whose sudden advent seemed of such ill omen esperance thought of all these things and was infinitely tortured by them but one by one he succeeded in dismissing them from his mind giovanni was certainly under a potent spell that might lead him to the commission of any indiscretion but he was at bottom a man of honour and there was some chance that his better feelings might obtain the mastery of his mere physical inclinations at any rate esperance felt that he could trust him for one night more at least perhaps in the morning he would awaken to a true sense of his position and acknowledge his error he might even implore his friend's pardon admit that he was right and consent to return to rome leaving the bewitching annunziata in all her innocence and purity upon reflection esperance decided that the stranger could be in no wise the associate or accomplice of the viscount for the latter had communicated with no one had not even gone a dozen steps from the solara cabin during his entire period of convalescence the idea of collusion was untenable esperance resolved to watch and wait there was no telling what a few hours might bring forth but at the worst he would fight if he fell he would not regret it and if giovanni perished at his hands his death would be due to his own headlong impulses and his blood under the circumstances could not be a disgraceful dishonourable stain towards nightfall old pasquale solara began to display unwonted activity showing at the same time signs of considerable agitation he was yet uncommunicative and morose spoke only at rare intervals often he did not reply at all to the questions addressed to him and when he did answer it, it was only in gruff snappish monosyllables he went from place to place uneasily frequently leaving the cabin and gazing peeringly and stealthily into the forest as if he expected some one or was looking for some secret signal known only to himself he glanced at lorenzo and esperance suspiciously seeking as it were to penetrate their very thoughts when he encountered annunziata he examined her from head to foot with a strange mixture of satisfaction anxiety and tremulousness at such times there was a greedy wolfish expression in his glittering eyes and his hands worked nervously when twilight had given place to darkness he suddenly left the hut and did not return his unusual conduct had occasioned somewhat of a commotion in the little household but quiet reigned after his departure and his singular behaviour was speedily forgotten by his children not so however with esperance the young man agitated as he was with the turmoil of his own feelings could not get old pasquale and his behaviour out of his mind it filled him with sinister forebodings and made him look forward to the night with an indefinable dread not unmingled with absolute fear it seemed to him that the old shepherd was meditating some dark and desperate deed that would be put into execution with disastrous results ere dawn the evening nevertheless passed without incident and in due course sleep brooded over the solara cabin wrapping all its inmates in silence and repose 
all its inmates all save the son of monte cristo who tossed restlessly upon his couch and could not close his eyes at length however he managed to calm himself somewhat and was just sinking into a sort of half slumber when he was suddenly roused by a wild far echoing cry that caused him to leap instantly from his bed the cry was a woman's and he thought he recognized the voice of annunziata solara a second's thought seemed to satisfy him on this point for the flower-girl was the only female in the vicinity and the voice was certainly hers but it sounded from a distance without the cabin and this fact bewildered him promptly old solara's conduct returned to his mind and instinctively he connected the morose shepherd with the cry and whatever was happening the young man had not removed his garments it was therefore only the work of an instant for him to grasp his pistol which he kept loaded beneath his pillow and rush from the hut in the direction of the cry which had been repeated but was growing fainter and fainter as he emerged from the cabin he heard a shot echo through the forest and almost immediately a man rushed into his arms bleeding profusely from a gaping wound in the temple the night was moonless and dark but in the feeble and uncertain light esperance recognized lorenzo my sister my sister poor annunziata the young peasant gasped painfully your friend abducted gone oh my god and he sank to the ground an unconscious mass quivering in the final agonies of dissolution esperance was horror-stricken annunziata abducted by giovanni he could draw no other conclusion from the young peasant's broken exclamations lorenzo slain too and doubtlessly also by the impetuous viscount's hand oh it was horrible it was almost beyond belief he bent over lorenzo's prostrate form straightened it out and felt in the region of the heart there was no beat it was as he had divined annunziata's manly and generous brother was dead the victim of a cowardly treacherous assassin and that assassin oh he could not think of it and retain his faith in men esperance left lorenzo's corpse lying upon the sward and pistol in hand started forward to go to annunziata's aid to rescue her from her dastardly abductor if it lay within his power to do so he reached the forest and plunged into its sombre depths scarcely had he gone twenty feet when a man carrying a flaming torch rushed wildly by him in his shirt-sleeves hatless his short thick grey hair standing almost erect upon his head in the sudden flash of light his haggard eyes blazed like those of a maniac in his left hand he held a long keen bladed knife he glanced neither to the right nor the left but kept straight on as if he were a ferocious bloodhound in pursuit of human prey esperance came to an abrupt pause and stared with wide open eyes at the startling apparition it was old pasquale solara the son of monte cristo shuddered as he thought that the father with all his italian ferocity thoroughly aroused was in pursuit of the man who had abducted his daughter and murdered his son in that event the viscount's death was sure for he could not escape the vengeance of the distracted and remorseless shepherd should he raise his voice and warn him no a thousand times no giovanni deserved death and did the furious old man inflict it he would be only advancing the just punishment of the outraged law quickly resolving to follow in the footsteps of pasquale solara esperance dashed on utterly regardless of the bushes and briars that impeded his progress and tore great rents in his garments soon excited voices reached him then the noise of a violent struggle he pushed rapidly forward intent upon reaching the scene of conflict where he did not doubt the hapless annunziata would be found soon he indistinctly saw two men engaged in a hand-to-hand -hand strife one was evidently pasquale solara for a torch was smouldering on the ground half extinguished by the damp moss and the young man caught an occasional flash of a knife such as the shepherd had carried when he passed him but beyond these circumstances all was supposition for the identity of the contending men could not be made out in the obscurity grasping his pistol tightly esperance was about 
declaring his presence when the figure of a man sprang up before him with the suddenness of a flash of lightning seeming to emerge from the very ground at his feet at that instant the torch gave a brilliant gleam and went out but in that gleam espérance recognized the man who opposed his progress as the strange peasant he had seen reading caesar's commentaries the previous afternoon by the brook in the vicinity of the solara cabin was he too mixed up in the abduction and how again the suspicion returned to espérance that he was the confederate the accomplice of the viscount massetti remain where you are commanded the intruder sternly if you advance another step the consequences be upon your own head stand aside and let me pass thundered the young man presenting his pistol at his opponent's head the other gave a low laugh made a quick movement and espérance's weapon went whirling swiftly through the air meanwhile the sounds of strife had ceased and the almost impenetrable darkness of the forest effectually prevented the young man from distinguishing anything a yard distant as his pistol was hurled from his grasp he closed his fists tightly set his teeth firmly together and made a frantic dash at the peasant the latter leaped aside with surprising agility vanishing instantaneously among the clustering trees so sudden was his leap that espérance carried on by the strong impetus he had given himself plunged wildly into a clump of bushes and fell headlong upon a thick growth of moss the softness of which prevented him from sustaining even the slightest bruise as he came in contact with the moss his hand touched something cold that sent an icy shiver through him from head to foot instinctively he recognized the object as a human face and passing his hand along he felt the body and limbs great heavens who was this had another murder been done would there ever be an end to the horrors and mysteries of this dreadful night the body was that of a man as Spérance arose to his knees and drawing a match safe from his pocket struck a light as the flame flashed upon the countenance of the unconscious man the features of giovanni massetti appeared espérance was stunned how was this the viscount there beneath his hand cold and motionless who then could have been the individual with whom old pasquale solara had been struggling but a moment since truly the mysteries of this night were becoming too complicated for solution and where was the unfortunate annunziata had she escaped from her captor or captors had she been rescued had she perished like her ill-fated brother or had the abduction been successfully accomplished none of these questions could espérance answer one thing however was plain there was no trace of her now no clue that he could follow therefore further pursuit for the present was useless sadly he determined to wait for day and then resolve upon some plan to put into immediate execution to retrieve as far as possible the great wrong that had been done but giovanni must be attended to guilty or innocent dead or alive he could not be abandoned where he was humanity demanded that some effort be made in his behalf perhaps too if he were in a condition to speak some key to the strange bewildering and terrible transactions of the night might be obtained espérance raised him in his arms and carried him to the brook near the solara cabin by this time the moon had arisen and in its silvery rays he examined him thoroughly there was no trace of blood no wound only a large bruise on his forehead as if he had been struck with some heavy object and knocked down unconscious he was alive for his heart was beating and once or twice he had moved on the sward where espérance had placed him the young man made a cup of his hands and dipping some cool water from the stream dashed it in the viscount's face instantly he opened his eyes gazing about him in bewilderment he sat up and stared wildly at espérance what is the matter how came i here he asked in astonishment then suddenly putting his hand to the bruise on his forehead as if it pained him he continued ah yes i remember it all now luigi vampa struck me luigi vampa struck you cried espérance more amazed than ever yes after he had forced me to take a fearful oath to remain silent silent about what the abduction of annunziata solara hush hush do not mention that girl's name vampa or some of his men may be lurking in the vicinity and here what has become of her at least tell me that you know as god is my judge i do not were you not with her to-night did you not forcibly take her from the cabin no no 
who did them alas my oath compels silence on that point your oath that is a very convenient excuse giovanni luigi vampa was not here to-night he was he lurked around the cabin all day that when darkness came he might commit the blackest deed that ever sullied the record of mankind instantly espérance recollected the peasant he had met that afternoon beside the brook the man who but a short while before had opposed his passage and disarmed him in the forest his vague familiarity with his voice face and dress was now accounted for the man was luigi vampa there could be no doubt of it but why had he abducted annunziata solara as giovanni's words would seem to infer why save as the confederate and accomplice of the viscount massetti but then how had giovanni communicated with him and in what manner had they contrived to arrange the details of their dishonourable plot was it possible that old pasquale had been the medium of correspondence between the two men had he been base enough to sell his child in that case with whom had he fought so fiercely and desperately in the forest why also had the brigand chief sworn giovanni to silence vain questions admitting of no satisfactory replies the viscount's story was incredible it was without doubt a mere fabrication intended to cover and conceal his own guilt in the premises still esperance could not reconcile this theory with the fact of finding giovanni senseless in the forest the young italian had by this time fully recovered from the effects of the shock he had received he arose to his feet and approaching esprance said earnestly my friend let the past be forgotten i was wrong and you were right i ask your pardon as to the abduction of this unfortunate girl i assure you that i am entirely innocent of it but who fired the shot that killed lorenzo asked esprance sternly killed lorenzo cried giovanni with unmistakable horror was lorenzo killed he was shot to-night and died in my arms oh this is terrible exclaimed the viscount beads of cold perspiration breaking out upon his forehead i assure you esperance i had no hand in this foul murder i knew nothing of it i did hear the report of a pistol but who discharged the weapon or at whom it was fired i could not tell everything seemed like a disordered dream as esperance said not a word in reply the viscount continued again i assert my innocence of the dark crimes that have been committed to-night do you not believe my protestation i know not what to believe answered the young man but i will not consider you guilty until you are proved so then cried giovanni joyously i have a proposition to make to you swear that you will be silent about everything that has occurred since we met annunziata solara in the piazza del popolo including the terrible events of to-night and i will start with you for rome this very instant and you will renounce your pursuit of the flower girl i will renounce it do you swear to do so i swear it then on my side i here take the oath of silence you require you forgive me for having quarrelled with you i forgive you then let us leave this accursed spot without another moment's delay so be it they hastily quitted the bank of the little stream and went to the cabin to prepare for their immediate departure as they passed the spot where lorenzo's body had lain esperance noticed with a start that it was no longer there they entered the cabin it was dark and deserted esperance lighted a candle and as he did so perceived a scrap of paper upon the floor he stooped mechanically and picked it up it was rumpled as if it had been crushed in the hand and cast away the young man straightened it out it was a brief letter he held it to the candle and with a sickening sensation at his heart read as follows dearest annunziata all is prepared we will fly to-night be ready tonio the note was in massetti's handwriting esperance silently passed it to him the viscount read it with eyes bulging from their sockets his fingers trembling so he could scarcely hold the paper the evidence is conclusive said esperance icily as mazzetti finished reading it is a confession you abducted annunziata solara what can i say to justify myself cried giovanni bitterly oh that accursed oath and you have sworn me to silence also wretched man said esperance why was i so weak he looked scornfully at the viscount who stood with bowed head then he added i understand you now you did not wish me to betray you to set the hounds of justice on your track to cause you to be punished branded and disgraced you were shrewd and imposed upon me but my oath is sacred i will keep it 
let us return to rome at once as we originally proposed there i will challenge you in due form for an alleged insult and we will settle this matter at the pistol's mouth in a few moments more they were on their road to the eternal city leaving behind them the cabin into which they had brought ruin and death end of chapter nine chapter ten of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the countess of monte cristo rome was agitated by a vague scandal so vague in fact that nobody seemed to know the precise details it had arisen from a newspaper account given in the indefinite unsatisfactory way characteristic of roman journalism one of the city journals had published the statement that a young and very handsome peasant girl living with her father in the country beyond the trastevere had recently been abducted report said by a youthful member of the roman aristocracy that the reckless scion of nobility had courted and won her in the guise of a peasant had carried her off to a bandit fastness and there had eventually deserted her no names were given inquiry at the office of the journal elicited the fact that the proprietors had undoubted authority for the publication of the statement but no further information could be gained from them a few days later however the same newspaper gave the further particulars that the nobleman had been assisted in the effecting the abduction by a young foreigner residing in rome and that the brother of the unfortunate girl had been killed in attempting to rescue her that completed all the intelligence ever vouchsafed to the public in regard to the mysterious affair and thereafter the journal maintained an unbroken silence respecting the matter the rumour ran that its proprietors had been bribed by interested parties to say nothing further but this rumour could not be traced to any reliable source and was therefore by many considered a fabrication no steps were taken by the authorities in the premises and it was evident that the affair was to be allowed to die out still roman society was considerably excited conjectures as to the identity of the guilty party and his accomplice being rife in all the fashionable and aristocratic quarters of the city these conjectures however did not grow to positive statements though insidious hints were thrown out that those who guessed the viscount giovanni massetti to be the culprit were not far out of the way Massetti, it was known, had been absent from Rome for several days about the period the abduction was supposed to have taken place, but he did not deign to notice the hints current in regard to himself, and no one was hardy enough to question him. Nevertheless, some color was given to the rumors concerning him by the fact that immediately on his return to the city after the absence above referred to, he became involved in a violent quarrel with a young Frenchman generally supposed to be esperance the son of monte cristo who had once challenged him to a duel but the duel was not fought for some reason not made public the difference between the two fiery youths having been arranged through the mediation of mutual friends it was observed however and widely commented upon that although the twain had previously been almost inseparable companions esperance after this quarrel studiously avoided the viscount massetti refraining from even mentioning his name meanwhile at civita vecchia another act in the drama of annunziata solara's clouded life had been played in that city was located a famous asylum for unfortunate women founded and managed by a french lady of enormous wealth and corresponding benevolence madame helena de rancogne the countess of monte cristo 
this lady was untiring in her efforts to reclaim and rehabilitate the fallen of her sex she was the superior of the order of sisters of refuge the members of which were scattered throughout europe but made their headquarters at the asylum in civita vecchia where a sufficient number of them constantly aided madame de rancogne in carrying out her good and philanthropic work the refuge as the asylum was called was a vast edifice of grey stone with a sombre and cloister-like look over the huge entrance door on a tablet of polished metal this sentence was encrusted in conspicuous letters of black be not led to consider any unworthy it was an utterance of the countess of monte cristo in the past and had been adopted as the guiding rule and maxim of the order of sisters of refuge the interior of the building in no way corresponded with its gloomy forbidding outside tall wide windows freely admitted the ardent rays of the glowing italian sun flooding the corridors and apartments with cheerful light and warmth crimson hangings and magnificently wrought tapestry of fabulous price adorned the walls while costly and beautiful statues and paintings the work of old masters and contemporaneous artists added to the attractiveness of the numerous salons and drawing-rooms the great refectory and the dormitories possessed charms of their own bright colours everywhere greeting the eye and nothing being allowed that could inspire or promote melancholy moods or painful thoughts there was an immense library to which all the inmates of the refuge had free access it was sumptuously furnished and the floor was covered with a gorgeous turkey carpet so thick and soft that footsteps made no sound upon it while the brilliant figures of tropical flowers profusely studying it gave the impression of eternal summer desks abundantly supplied with writing materials tables loaded with the latest newspapers and periodicals in all the languages of europe luxurious sofas and inviting fauteuils allured those succoured by the countess of monte cristo and her vigilant aids on every side the library was surrounded with bookcases containing absorbing romances volumes of travel the productions of the celebrated poets histories and essays with a liberal sprinkling of religious works mostly non-sectarian and invariably of a consolatory character in addition elegantly and thoroughly equipped work-rooms were provided in which those who were so inclined could practise embroidery sew or manufacture the thousand and one little fancy knick-knacks at which female fingers are so skilful nothing however was compulsory the main object being to afford the inmates of the refuge agreeable occupation to elevate them and to prevent them from looking back regretfully to the agitated lives they had led and the vices that had held empire over them in the past truly a more generous unselfish lover of her sex than the noble countess of monte cristo did not exist the protege of the sisters of the order of refuge embraced women of all ages all nationalities and all conditions in life they included parisian grisettes and lorettes recruited by nini moustache in her coquettish apartment of the chaussee d'antin for nini had proved a most effective missionary young girls who had fallen a prey to designing roue and been abandoned to the whirl of that gulf of destruction the streets of paris spanish senoritas who had listened too credulously to the false vows of faithless lovers italian peasant girls whose pretty faces and charms of person had been their ruin unfortunate german english dutch and scandinavian maidens and even brands snatched from the burning in russia turkey and greece this somewhat diverse community dwelt together in perfect sisterly accord chastened by their individual misfortunes encouraged and upheld in the path of reform by the countess of monte cristo who was to all the unfortunates as a tender thoughtful and considerate mother 
one quiet night just as darkness had settled down over the streets of civita vecchia a timid knock at the entrance door of the refuge aroused the portress on duty there such knocks were often heard and well understood the portress arose from her bench partly opened the door and admitted a trembling young girl whose crouching and shrunken form was clad in a mass of tattered rags a thin red cloak was thrown over her shoulders and her pale emaciated face spoke plainly of poverty hardship and suffering even giovanni massetti would have with difficulty recognized in this wretched outcast the once shapely and beautiful flower-girl of the piazza del popolo for the applicant at the refuge door was no other than the ill-fated annunziata solara her beauty had faded away like a summer dream vanished as the perfume from a withered hyacinth she stood before the portress silently with clasped hands the incarnation of misery distress and desertion what do you require my poor child asked the portress tenderly and sympathetically shelter only shelter replied the girl beseechingly in a hollow broken voice the ghost of her former full and joyous tones the superior must decide upon your case said the portress you shall go to her at once the woman touched a bell directing the sister of the order of refuge who answered it to conduct the applicant to the apartment of madame de roncagne the trembling annunziata was led through a long corridor and ushered into a small but cosy office in which sat an elderly lady of commanding and aristocratic presence whose head was covered with curls of silver hair and whose still handsome countenance wore an expressive look in which compassion and benevolence predominated this lady was the celebrated madame helena de roncagne whose adventures and exploits as the countess of monte cristo had in the past electrified every european nation she arose as annunziata entered welcoming her with a cordial comforting smile sit down my child she said in a rich melodious voice you are fatigued are you also hungry annunziata sank into the chair offered her covering her face with her thin hands alas signora she replied faintly i have walked many weary miles and have not tasted a morsel of food since dawn take the poor child to the refectory said the countess to the sister who had remained standing near the door after her hunger has been appeased i will see her again and question her half an hour later annunziata refreshed and strengthened by her meal once more sat in the office with the countess of monte cristo my child said the latter what is your name annunziata solara you have applied for shelter here the portress informs me do you know that this is an asylum for the fallen of your sex i know it signor that is the reason i came have you repented of your sin and do you desire to lead a better life i have repented bitterly answered the girl bursting into a flood of tears oh how bitterly god alone knows i wish to hide myself from the world i wish to atone for my shame by whatever good action my hands can find to do it is well said the countess her eyes lighting up with enthusiasm the field is wide and the order of sisters of refuge although large is always open for new additions much good has already been done but more remains to be accomplished infinitely more you shall be received and given an opportunity to share in the great work from the depths of my soul i thank you sobbed the girl i will try earnestly to be worthy of your benevolence tell me your story now said the superior i cannot believe that the guilt was altogether yours i am grateful signor for those words i was thoughtless and indiscreet but not criminal happy and contented in my humble peasant home i was pure and innocent i knew nothing of the wickedness of men of the snares set to entrap unwary young girls 
i lived with my father and brother in the vicinity of rome selling flowers in that city from time to time i had never had a suitor never had a lover my heart was free filled with the joyousness of youth i had been told that i possessed a fair share of beauty but that neither made me vain nor inclined me to coquetry oh signora i shall never be so happy again emotion overcame her and her tears started afresh the countess soothed her and she continued one fatal night my brother brought two strange young men to our cabin they appeared to be peasants like ourselves and one of them had been wounded in a fight with a brigand they remained with us for some days i nursed the wounded man who when he grew convalescent made love to me i listened to his ardent declarations submitted to his endearments i grew to love him in my turn and oh signora i believed in him trusted him at that period i had nothing to reproach myself with antonio that was my admirer's name seemed sincerity itself one day he asked me to fly with him but our conversation was interrupted and i gave him no answer i was confused i did not know what to do that evening i received a letter from him i found it on the table in the room i occupied concealed beneath my work-box telling me that everything was prepared for our flight that night and asking me to be in readiness i was terrified i could not understand why he wished me to fly with him if everything was as it should be as my father and brother would not have objected to any proper suitor for my hand on whom i had bestowed my heart for the first time i was suspicious of tonio and i resolved to pay no attention to his letter on the morrow i would see him and tell him to speak to my father and brother alas that opportunity was not given me oh that horrible horrible night she covered her face with her hands and shuddered when she looked up she was ghastly pale and her voice quivered as she resumed that dreadful night as i lay upon my bed wrapped in slumber i was suddenly aroused by hearing some one in my chamber it was very dark and i could not see the intruder i started up in terror but a hand was placed firmly over my mouth i was torn from my bed and borne in a man's arms from the cabin i struggled to release myself but in vain my abductor appeared to possess the strength of a giant there was no moon but in the dim starlight i could see that the man was masked he hastened with me into the neighbouring forest there he accidentally struck his right arm against the trunk of a tree and his hand dropped from my mouth instantly i uttered a loud piercing cry but the hand went back to its place again almost immediately and i was unable to give vent to another sound my cry however had been heard by my brother who hastened to my assistance he overtook my abductor in the forest and though unarmed at once attacked him the man dropped me and turned upon my brother a fierce struggle ensued during which the mask was struck from my abductor's face and to my horror i thought i recognized tonio suddenly there was a report of a pistol i had watched the conflict unable to move i saw my brother stagger blood was gushing from him i could endure no more i fell to the ground in a swoon when i recovered my senses i was in a strange hut savage-looking men whom i took to be bandits were guarding me how long i remained in the hut i do not know but it must have been several days at times a masked man came to me telling me that he was tonio and pressing his suit upon me i refused to listen to him upbraiding him for tearing me from my home and wounding my brother i told him his conduct was not that of a lover but of a villain i implored him if he possessed a spark of manhood to set me free to send me to my father he informed me that i was his captive and should so remain until i yielded to his wishes i repulsed him with scorn with the energy of desperation ultimately he overpowered me by sheer force and compelled me to yield then i saw him no more i wandered about the hut like one demented my cup of sorrow was full to overflowing i was in despair shame and degradation were henceforth my portion after my abductor's departure a newcomer appeared among the brigands 
he seemed to be their chief he expressed pity for me and told me that my abductor was not a peasant but a young roman nobleman the viscount giovanni massetti i cared nothing for this revelation i had no thought of vengeance my sole desire was to hide myself from the gaze of the world to avoid the pitiless finger of scorn eventually the bandit chief took me back to my home there i found my father learning from his lips that my brother was dead this intelligence made my sorrow utterly unbearable my father was moody and morose for days at a time he did not speak to me he appeared to have lost all paternal affection finally i left the cabin i had heard of the refuge and determined to seek its shelter i walked to civita vecchia and to-night found myself at your door such signor is my sad history i have told you the whole truth you see i am not altogether to blame as annunziata concluded the countess of monte cristo drew her upon her bosom my poor girl said she in tender pitying tones you have indeed tasted the bitterness of life and have been more sinned against than sinning but you are my daughter now the sisterhood of the order of refuge has covered you with its protecting shield End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of Monte Cristo's Daughter by Edmund Flagg. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: The Beggar and His Mates. A year had elapsed since the events already recorded. Zuleika, having finished her studies at the convent school of the Sisterhood of the Sacred Heart the count of monte cristo had quitted rome and with his family was established in paris in the palatial mansion number twenty seven rue du elder formerly occupied by the count de morcerf he was a member of the chamber of deputies representing marseilles and was wedded to his first love mercedes who had mysteriously reappeared and nursed him through a severe illness which was immediately followed by their marriage the revolution of eighteen forty eight which had placed m lamartine at the head of the provisional government had put power and office within his grasp but he had declined both preferring to work in the wider field of universal human freedom his eminent services during the revolution had rendered him immensely popular with the masses and the fame of his matchless eloquence added to the vast influence he so modestly wielded his colossal wealth which he lavishly used to promote the great cause he championed also tended to make him a conspicuous figure in the political and high social circles of the capital though he strove to court retirement zuleika and esperance fairly adored their mild kindly stepmother who on her side was as devotedly attached to them as if they had been her own children the count noted this mutual attachment which time only served to strengthen and it filled his heart with joy and gratification the family was indeed a happy one and even the servants shared the general felicity mademoiselle d'armilly's influence over captain joliette great as it undoubtedly was had been insufficient to induce that gallant and honourable young soldier to seek a rupture with the wonderful man to whom he was so vastly indebted and whom he so highly revered this had at first caused a coldness between the revengeful prima donna and her admirer but a reconciliation had ultimately taken place between them and they were now man and wife prior to their marriage mademoiselle d'armilly had acknowledged herself to be eugenie danglars and thus the motive of her bitter hostility to the count of monte cristo was revealed she had retired from the operatic stage and had received a large sum of money stated to be a legacy from her father but generally believed to be a gift from the count intended by him in some degree to make amends to her for the sufferings she had endured by reason of his vengeance on the banker danglars the prima donna's brother leon had turned out to be a 
a woman masquerading in male attire no other than mademoiselle d'armilly herself eugenie's former music teacher who had loaned her name to her friend when the latter started on her operatic career these transformations had been immediately followed by another captain joliette discarding his pseudonym and appearing as albert de morcerf paris had talked over and wondered at all this for a week and then had completely forgotten it turning its fickle attention to newer and more engrossing sensations albert's marriage and the legacy healed the breach between eugenie and the count of monte cristo and the young couple together with the real mademoiselle d'armilly had been added to the happy family in the mansion of the rue du helder the viscount giovanni massetti had appeared in paris immediately after his reckless visit to zuleika in the convent garden and his wild interview with her there he had gone to the count of monte cristo avowed his love for haydee's child and solicited her hand in marriage he had been told to wait a year a period he had passed he scarcely knew how but it had been an eternity to him an eternity fraught with restless anxiety with alternations between ardent hope and the depths of despair the expiration of his probation found him in the mansion of the rue du helder renewing his earnest suit with the count who had granted him permission to win his daughter if he could the young italian had at once sought zuleika who had welcomed him as her lover and betrothed then a clash had suddenly arisen esperance had expressed his abhorrence of his sister's suitor had given mysterious hints that had recalled the half-forgotten roman scandal and a separation between giovanni and zuleika had ensued the former refusing to speak out and clear himself pleading his terrible oath of silence in the course of his vague unsatisfactory disclosures esperance had unguardedly mentioned the name of luigi vampa and the count of monte cristo had written to the brigand chief requesting such information as he possessed in regard to the impenetrable mystery vampa's reply had been a fearful arraignment of the youthful viscount but zuleika could not believe her lover the depraved and guilty wretch the brigand chief represented him to be asserting that there was something yet unexplained something that would effectually exculpate him could it be reached the count of monte cristo had at first inclined to the belief that massetti was merely the victim of circumstances of some remarkable coincidence but vampa's letter scattered this belief to the winds and he demanded that the viscount should conclusively prove his innocence zuleika had meanwhile banished her lover from her presence but her heart yearned for him and defended him in spite of everything she therefore sent him vampa's letter assuring him of her belief in his innocence and commanding him to prove it to her and to the world thereupon giovanni had instantly quitted paris his sudden disappearance seemed like a flight it caused scandal's thousand tongues to wag remorselessly but although he left no word for her zuleika knew her command had sent him to italy to clear his name and record in her eyes she was firmly convinced that she would see him again that he would return to paris rehabilitated such was the general condition of affairs as affecting the monte cristo family at the time the thread of this narrative is resumed it was the month of july the heat in paris was intense absolutely stifling a white glow seemed to fall from the breezeless yellow atmosphere scorching the very pavements for weeks there had been no rain not the slightest sign of a cloud in the pitiless heavens the streets were almost deserted even that favoured thoroughfare of fashion the rue de la paix boasted of but few promenaders the only spot in request was the bois de boulogne with its magnificent trees and deliciously shaded avenues the champs-elysees throughout its entire extent from the place de la concorde to the arc de l'etoile was like a sun-swept desert and its picturesque marchands de coco with their shining mugs snow-white aprons and tinkling bells found only a limited demand for their licorice water and lemon juice while even the theatre de guignol failed to arrest the rare passers 
in the vast garden of the monte cristo mansion notwithstanding its power elsewhere the sun seemed to have been successfully defied there the trees shrubs and plants were not parched but preserved all their freshness and beauty suggesting the coolness of early spring rather than the sweltering heat of midsummer while the parterres were brilliant with gorgeous bloom and penetrating perfumes loaded the air near a little gate opening upon the rue du helder early one morning zuleika and mademoiselle d'armilly were sitting on a rustic bench beneath an ample honeysuckle covered arbour they had come to the garden from the breakfast-room to rest and chat after their meal the former music-teacher was telling her companion of her stage experience and of the many adventures she had met with during her operatic career in the midst of a most interesting recital she suddenly paused fixing her eyes upon the little gate with a cry of surprise and terror zuleika followed the direction of her glance and gave a start as she saw leaning against the bars of the gate a sinister-looking man clad in dusty tattered garments who was peering at her companion and herself with eyes that glittered like those of some venomous serpent when he noticed that he was observed the man pulled a greasy weather-stained cap from his head disclosing a profusion of matted whitened locks and stretching a grimy hand with hooked fingers that resembled the claws of an enormous bird through the bars said in the hoarse tones peculiar to the outcasts of the streets charity for the love of god the man seemed more like a thief than a beggar nevertheless mademoiselle d'armilly who was the first to recover her self-possession drew a few sous from her pocket and advanced to place them in his palm as she came closer to him the mendicant acted very strangely instead of taking the money he suddenly withdrew his hand staring at mademoiselle d'armilly with an expression of mingled terror and amazement upon his evil countenance then he quickly turned from the gate thrust on his cap and started off at a rapid pace mademoiselle d'armilly also was singularly affected she dropped the sou became ashy pale and would have fallen to the ground had not zuleika sprung to her side and caught her in her arms what is the matter louise cried the girl astonished at the beggar's behaviour and still more so at the effect he had produced upon her companion i have seen a ghost replied mademoiselle d'armilly in a startling whisper a ghost yes oh let us quit the garden at once the ghost of whom i dare not say come come i cannot remain here another second how fortunate that young madame de morcerf was not with us she would have been driven mad albert's wife you talk wildly louise what interest could she feel in that wretched outcast what interest do not ask me i cannot i must not tell you oh it is terrible will you tell albert's wife of what you have seen no a thousand times no she must not even suspect that man's return from the grave i entreat you to say nothing to her or any one else i shall be silent upon the subject but that beggar was not a ghost he was a most substantial reality something frightened him away something doubtless that he saw in the street perhaps a sergent de ville your recognition of him was fancied it was not fancied but we must not stay here i would not see that face those eyes again for worlds zuleika took her friend's arm and walked with her towards the mansion endeavouring as they went along to reassure her to reason her out of her fright her efforts however proved altogether futile mademoiselle d'armilly was utterly unnerved and at once retired to her room notwithstanding her willingness to believe that mademoiselle d'armilly had been deceived with regard to the identity of the beggar and in her confusion had confounded him with some one else zuleika could not altogether shake off a feeling of vague apprehension of ill-defined terror when she thought over the singular conduct and wild agitation of the former music-teacher in the quiet and solitude of her own chamber why had mademoiselle d'armilly been so stricken at the sight of the mendicant why had she so earnestly entreated her to say nothing of what had occurred to any one and especially to avoid all mention of the matter to albert de morcerf's wife mademoiselle d'armilly had seen too much of the world to be frightened by a mere trifle 
was it possible that the ragged outcast had been in some way identified with young madame de morcerf's operatic career that he had been her lover the latter supposition would furnish a plausible cause for the former music-teacher's terror as the reappearance of a lover might lead to disclosures well calculated to seriously disturb the happiness and tranquillity of the newly made husband and wife zuleika had heard that eugenie had been much courted during the period she was on the stage that she had numbered her ardent admirers by scores but this man seemed too old too forlorn to have recently been in a position to scatter wealth at the feet of a prima donna besides mademoiselle d'armilly had spoken of him as a ghost and had appeared to refer him to a period more remote zuleika had also heard of mademoiselle danglars broken marriage contract away back in the past could this beggar be the scoundrel who had masqueraded under the assumed title of prince calvacanti and had so nearly become her husband perhaps but even if he were that unscrupulous wretch what harm could his reappearance do at this late day now that the old story had been thoroughly sifted and almost forgotten albert was well aware of all the details of the calvacanti episode and it was hardly likely that anything further could be exposed that would disturb either him or his wife no the grimy white-haired sinister-looking stranger could not be the quondam prince he was someone else someone more to be feared but who was he if not the miserable son of villefort zuleika was more perplexed and disturbed than she was willing to admit even to herself if she could only speak with the count of monte cristo tell him all some explanation of the mystery might doubtless be obtained an explanation that would at least calm her vague fears but that was impossible her promise to mademoiselle d'armilly to be silent sealed her lips as effectually with her father as with young madame de Mercerf whatever might be her fears she would have to bear them alone or at the best share them with mademoiselle d'armilly who evidently would give her no further satisfaction meanwhile the man who had caused all this trouble after having almost run quite a distance along the rue du helder utterly oblivious of the attention he drew to himself from the rare passers turned into the rue Tebou thence reached the rue de provence and finally found himself in the cite d'antin there he made his way into a small drinking-shop or caboulot patronized by some of the worst prowlers about that section of paris the room he entered was unoccupied save by a slatternly young woman who sat behind the counter reading a greasy copy of the gazette des tribunaux the man went to the counter and throwing down the price demanded a glass of brandy which he swallowed at a gulp then he addressed the slatternly young woman who with her paper still in one hand was half smiling half scowling at him is waldman here he asked with the air of a man who feels himself thoroughly at home yes answered the young woman resuming her seat and her reading he is in the back room playing piquet with peppino beppo and Cybecker good said the man i am in luck i scarcely expected to find them all in at this hour with this he opened a glazed door and stepping into the back room closed it behind him the players who were seated at a table with mugs of beer beside them glanced up quickly from their game as he came in and one of them a heavy-framed beetle-browed german called out to him speaking french how now bouche de miel what is the matter you are out of breath and as pale as if you had been shadowed by an agent de la sureté i have not been shadowed waldman answered the beggar or bouche de miel but i have made a startling discovery the players at once put down their cards and leaned forward to hear they were a rough desperate-looking set on their ill-omened and sunburnt visages thief could be read as plainly as if it were written there and perhaps also the still more significant word assassin two of the men were italians evidently the peppino and beppo referred to by the slatternly young woman at the counter in the outer room besides waldman there was another german this was Cybecker, tall slim with yellow hair and moustache he had some claim to good looks his attire was quite respectable compared to that of the rest had he not possessed a pair of restless demoniac eyes he might have passed for a person of tolerably fair repute 
but those glaring tiger-like orbs betrayed his true character and stamped him as a very dangerous member of the criminal fraternity wallman appeared to be the leader of the coterie the italians wore blue blouses but the distinctive garment of the parisian workman could not conceal a certain brigandish air that was second nature to them let's hear about your startling discovery bouche de miel said waldman take a seat and tell us the beggar dropped upon a wooden chest saying in a tone of deep dejection as he did so much as i long to take a hand in to-night's little job i'm afraid you'll have to let me off stuff cried waldman you are afraid of meeting that terrible fellow the count of monte cristo but the startling discovery out with it man yes the discovery the discovery demanded the others impatiently well said bouge de miel i went to the rue du helder this morning as agreed upon and made a survey of monte cristo's mansion nothing easier than to get in as no watch is kept at night and the count is not in the least suspicious although he has millions of francs in his safe to say not a word of jewels and other valuables as i was about leaving the premises i stopped at a little gate giving access to the garden from the street having noticed that the key had been carelessly left in the lock on the outside i was leaning against the gate taking a wax impression of this key which would assure us entrance without trouble when happening to glance through the grating into the garden i saw two women they had noticed me and seemed greatly frightened instantly i thrust my hand through the bars and asked for charity one of the women summoned up sufficient courage to arise and approach me she was about to give me some money when suddenly she recognized me in spite of all the changes in my appearance i also recognized her and hastened away as rapidly as i could well what of all this said wallman calmly it amounts to nothing whatever it amounts to so much that i cannot go with you to monte cristo's house and run the risk of meeting that woman wallman gave vent to a loud laugh the other smiled i never before heard of a frenchman who was afraid to meet a woman said Sybecker, much amused i tell you i cannot go you must let me off said bouche de miel obstinately what cried peppino do you allow a woman to stand between you and your vengeance against the count of monte cristo remember luigi vampa's bill of fare bouche de miel glared at the italian savagely there is no need for me to remember it returned he bitterly i have never forgotten it neither have i forgotten your share in that infamous business he added between his teeth it was my duty to do as i was bidden retorted peppino i will have my revenge on you yet muttered bouche de miel menacingly we shall see answered the italian defiantly wallman interposed and said sternly no quarrelling we are brothers and are united for mutual gain bouche de miel you must go with us to-night i order you to go and will take no excuse besides if as peppino says you have vengeance to gratify against the count of monte cristo the opportunity is too precious for you to neglect it at any rate go you shall where is the wax impression of the key bouche de miel handed the german a small package which he took from his pocket wallman gave it to Sybecker, directing him to fashion a key in accordance with it in the meantime the beggar had been thinking his face showed that a fierce struggle was taking place in his mind a struggle between fear and a burning desire for revenge the latter ultimately triumphed and the beggar rising from the chest went to the table bringing his fist down upon it with a resounding blow i will accompany you mates he said with wildly flashing eyes and in an excited voice monte cristo robbed me ruined me and drove me into the world a penniless vagrant i will have my revenge spoken like a hero said wallman enthusiastically we will meet at the little gate on the rue du helder at midnight Sybecker will give you the key bouche de miel and you will open the gate you need not fear recognition even if you should meet the woman you have spoken of face to face for you will be masked like the rest of us if you are anxious about her safety i will tell you now that we only want monte cristo's millions we do not mean murder but what if murder should be necessary if it cannot be avoided waldman shrugged his shoulders then we must protect ourselves he answered phlegmatically thereupon the coterie of miscreants separated to pass away the hours as best they might until the time for the brilliant stroke they meditated arrived End of chapter 11